and welcome to NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi. Today, the show is coming to you from four different locations as we highlight just some of the new faces linked to the protection of wildlife. Now, March the 3rd was World Wildlife Day, and here now is just a reminder about the status of our wildlife here in Kenya. The future of wildlife is in our hands, and the future of elephants is in our hands. These were the themes of World Wildlife Day 2016, marked on the 3rd of March. The day is set aside each year to celebrate and raise awareness of the world's wild animals and plants, and in particular, highlight species that are under threat. The African elephant is one of the world's iconic species that is at risk of extinction in years to come if the poaching disaster is not addressed efficiently enough and fast enough. An estimated 100 African elephants are killed every day, that's one every 15 minutes for their ivory tusks. Poaching and illegal wildlife trafficking pose some of the major threats to Kenya's wildlife. But there are other challenges too, such as corruption, human-wildlife conflict, development, climate change and land grabbing, as expressed in these sound bites by experts speaking on previous episodes of NTV Wild Talk. Species like the African elephant and the rhino are being wiped out across this globe, and particularly in Africa, because of the illegal trade. If they are attacked inside the game reserve, in my opinion, zero compensation. This is the home for those predators and for those animals. The wildlife problems in this Kenya can be fixed, but the biggest enemy is corruption. But there are also successes. Kenya has made several gains over the years. Last year, according to KWS, there were under 100 elephants that were poached out of a population of maybe 35,000. And only 11 rhinos were poached out of a population of about 1,000 and we haven't had a figure of 11 for many, many years. Why has Kenya been successful in reducing the elephant and rhino poaching? Before 2014, we had not seen any sort of uh, intergovernmental and international involvement of, of international law enforcement agencies in going after uh, wildlife crime. We are trying to educate community on the importance of the animal, wild animals because they are also benefiting directly. And as for the future... With better surveillance, better equipment, better information, interagency oper uh, operations, coordinating with all agencies, both nationally, regionally and internationally, we have seen the results. But I always say we're always on high alert and we always remain vigilant. So that's where we stand as a country. Now, key in protecting our wildlife is the KWS, that is the Kenya Wildlife Service, which is now led by a new director general. His name is Kitili Mbathi, and I caught up with him in the Nairobi National Park. So we are in the Nairobi National Park. Kitili, essentially, this is your new office. What's it like being the head of the Kenya Wildlife Service? It hasn't been a long time, but so far. It is phenomenal and welcome to our park. Um, some mornings I come driving through here and it's not unusual to see um, a couple of lions, some rhinos and um, 10 minutes away from my office, it's phenomenal. I can imagine, um, but I believe we are protected right now where we're standing. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do have security around us, but walk with me as we talk. Um, this is the only park in the city and behind us we can actually see the skyline. Uh, for some people, you know, it's, it's a beautiful sight, but for others it's a bit of an eyesore. What are some of the challenges that you have come across so far, particularly about this park? I think um, the biggest challenge, of course, has been the lions who um, have escaped, escape every once in a while right. into the barracks. barracks. Um, but the other challenge, of course, is when it was first set up, there was a dispersal area which would lead them all the way down to Amboseli. Because of the human um, settlement that's coming up in Kitangela, that um, is going to be an increasing challenge. And... Um, in the future, uh, unfortunately, I can imagine that the whole park is going to have to be fenced up. And Kitili, we'll come to that in a moment, yeah. but what is it like uh, coming into this docket, which is um, a government docket essentially, um, having come from the private sector? It is um, 
a huge change. Um, things work very differently in government. Um, I have had uh, a short stint in government about 15 years ago. And when this opportunity came up, I thought, you know, this might be a time to do something very challenging and make a mark, um, you know, for the heritage of wildlife in Kenya and give something back to the country. Speaking about challenges, why is it important that you come and address the challenges that Kenya's wildlife faces? What does it mean to you? I think um, we've been blessed in this country with a wildlife heritage that is unique. Um, you know, I was flying over a lake in um, the Mount Kenya area and to see 300 elephants just out of the blue drinking water and frolicking in the, the mud, you know, it's, we've just got a unique heritage of wildlife and it's under immense threat and if we don't um, galvanize and rally around it and really put in place a system which will ensure its sustainability, it's going to be gone before our very eyes. Well, you're in charge of the Kenya Wildlife Service now. How do you intend to address some of these threats? It's not an easy task. Well, I'm happy to say that I'm coming in at a time when uh, KWS has demonstrated its ability to curb poaching. Um, we've seen a dramatic fall in poaching over the past couple of years. Um, it's not an excuse for us to relent. We need to do what we do, do more of what we're doing successfully and continue to try and inculcate uh, the sort of love for the animals amongst the general Kenyan populace as you and I have, for right. instance. Uh, who is Kitili, Kitili Mbathi? Um, how would you describe yourself because you are a newcomer uh, to this scene? I am a newcomer to this scene. I'm a career banker. I used to be um, a regional director for CFC Stanbic, um, working in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Zambia, and Malawi. Um, but, you know, I, I, I love Kenya and I love the opportunity to try and put in place um, a sustainable operation in KWS so that my great-grandchildren will be able to see lions and rhino in this very park right. in years to come. What are some of your, say, top few priorities as the head of the Kenya Wildlife Service? I think the number one, of course, is to really reinforce and strengthen our anti-poaching effort because um, our elephants and our rhinos are under constant threat. We spend a lot of time following them and tracking them and we need to do more of that. Um, the other thing that is a big challenge is um, areas where humans and wildlife come into conflict. Either the animals go into the farms or people come and poach our animals for food and of course we know for trophies mm -hmm. and and rhino horns so poaching number one number two human wildlife um, challenges and i think number three is just to ensure the financial sustainability of kws well, we're standing at a relatively significant spot this is where tons and tons of ivory is set to be burnt at the end of April. Tell us a little bit more about that. I think I've come in at a phenomenal time when um, a promise that His Excellency made to the world that uh, Kenya was so committed to conservation and to um, de-monetizing um, the value of, of ivory tusks and rhino horns that we are going to burn in excess of 120 tons of the stock of Kenya's ivory, all of the stock which we'll be able to get our hands on, and a ton and a half of rhino horn. And I think this is a phenomenal statement to the world that Kenya is committed to having ivory on elephants and horns on rhinos and no intrinsic value to the horns when they're, or the ivory when it's not on the animals. Speaking about commitment, how can Kenyans bank on you? What sort of commitment can you give us as the Director General of the Kenya Wildlife Service? I think um, I'm in a wonderful place where 
um, KWS has already demonstrated its commitment to fighting poaching and has been successful at it. We need to be more successful at it. And with the support of the government and uh, the rangers in KWS, we intend to take it to the next level. All right, it's just been about a month that you've been in office, but so far, what have been some of the most perhaps interesting experiences that you've uh, encountered? I think um, part of it has been um, the training camp at Manyani. I went to see the rangers and see the sort of people the rangers are and to meet some of the rangers, some of the uh, rhino um, rangers here in this park and how committed they are. And they are, you know, just regular Kenyans and they are so passionate and committed to protecting our wildlife, you know, that you run it, if a poacher runs into them, they are going to be in trouble because these people are extremely committed. So when I see that sort of passion, it really has um, energized me to try and make it easier for them to improve their livelihoods and to really give them the boost to keep that passion going to protect our wildlife. Kitili, it's not only the passion that perhaps we see in them, but in you too, and we certainly wish you all the very best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So from Nairobi to the Maasai Mara, and that's where I spoke to Lena Munge. Now, she is the new Minister for Tourism in Narok, a county that's key to the country's economy because it is, of course, home to the Maasai Mara, a world-class tourist destination. Here's my conversation with her. We are in the Maasai Mara National Reserve. Lena, you are now the Minister for Tourism and Wildlife here in Narok County. Essentially, this is your office, an incredible background with herds of elephants in the background. I love it. Thank you so much for joining us. You're new to this docket. Who is Lena? Indeed. It's really an honor and a privilege uh, to serve in this office. I mean, Masai Mara is the greatest wildlife destination in the world, award-winning. And I'm one of the lucky people who actually get to have an office here. I am a local girl, brought, born and brought up in Narok. And I've been in the corporate world for the last 15 years. I'm actually a banker by profession, worked in banking for the last 15 years or so years and now I came back when the county government came in place to come and serve the public so you left back the, home you left the private sector to join the public sector essentially that also means taking a big pay cut why would you do that I think the issue is not really about pay it's about serving the public I am from back home and I thought it's a high time some of us who are professionals came and delivered our services to the public you know, the public sector is very rewarding because we get to serve the public in places where the private sector cannot come in. Look at infrastructure, look at roads. We're basically here to deliver services. And there are some certain areas where the private sector cannot come in. And that is why we're here. Lena, no doubt the public sector is filled with challenges. Let's specify on your docket, that is the wildlife and tourism aspect here in Narok County. What are some of the big challenges that face your docket? Okay, like any other place, we have different challenges. We have global challenges such as poaching and security, and we have local challenges such as human wildlife conflict and encroachment. So those are some of the issues we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. How do you intend to deal with some of these problems? Um, one, we do have we have started the process of putting in place the Maasai Mara management plan. As you know, management is essential. All the players have to work together. The conservationists, the local community, the lodge owners, the transport operators and the air operators, all of them need to come together under a certain management plan. Secondly, the management plan is a requirement under the current Wildlife Act 2013. So we have to do it. Lena, what do you, as Lena, with a background in banking professionally, intend to bring to this docket? How do you intend to use your background to serve this docket? The first thing I intend to do is put in place proper management. Like you know, um, 
This, just like any corporate organization, needs to be professionally managed. That's the first thing. Secondly, we need to adapt to the changing systems. Now, you know we have very many challenges and the nature and the scale and degree of challenges have kept changing. So we have to adapt our strategies to respond to the changing nature of the challenges that I've mentioned already. Secondly, use of technology. We need to adapt to technology and as you know, right now we're using a lot of technology to manage the parks in terms of security, in terms of tracking the animals. So we're adapting to just like in corporate management, we do adapt some of those styles. How soon can we see some of these changes? Because when we look at the wildlife, we do know that some of our animals, particularly the elephants that are there roaming the earth in the background, are under threat. How soon can we see some of these changes? Indeed, we've already begun. We've been having an exercise of collaring the elephants. We put transmitters, we're able to track, especially when they go out to local communities, we're able to bring them back because we're able to track them and know exactly how they move. As you know, the Mara is an ecosystem which includes the Serengeti and the Mara conservancies. So as these animals, trans, you know, they move from one conservancy to the Mara, to the Serengeti, we're able to monitor their movements and be able to know when anything happens to them, we're able to respond as fast as we can using technology. Lena, what is your commitment to the docket, that is wildlife and tourism, and to the entire Maasai Mara as a whole? What can we expect from you? First, um, it's a responsibility. We have so many stakeholders who derive their livelihoods from here. They have employees. They put huge investments in the Mara. We have conservationists and we have researchers. So when you bring all these stakeholders together and make sure that all of them work towards the interest of the Mara, especially, and the local communities who, of course, are the greatest conservationists of all, then we should be able to improve our stakeholder engagement and relationships so that we are able to manage the Mara with a common interest. Secondly, we need to as Kenyans, you know, this resource belongs to us. We need Kenyans to come here and visit. It's not just international tourists who need to enjoy this splendid resource. We have Kenyans, it only costs 1,000 shillings for conservation fees to come into the park. And as you come into the park, we just want to ask you, please pay, because the payment that you get for getting into the park, the 1,000 shillings, foreigners pay $80, it goes towards the conservation efforts. So for us to sustain this resource, we're asking more Kenyans to visit this amazing reserve and help us because the money we get goes towards conservation. Then apart from the fact that this is now your responsibility, what do these animals, what does this wildlife mean to you personally? Because do you think that it's important that you ought to be passionate enable, to enable yourself to carry out this work wholesomely? I love the Mara and I think there's so many local people who love the Mara. Now, for me personally, this is a, an heritage. It was passed on to us by our forefathers. It is our responsibility to ensure we pass it on to the generations to come. So it is a responsibility and we're here to make it happen. How ready are you to work in the public sector. You've spent plenty of years in the private sector. You've only been in office for a few weeks now. Have you noticed any immediate differences? The Mara is always changing. Like you see, just like the seasons, we've come in here. We're expecting the high season to come in from July. We just have a short window to put in place certain basics to ensure that our high season is able to attract. The economy of Narok depends largely on the Mara. And so we have a responsibility to ensure that we support the local economy. Because as you know, Narok was among the top three revenue earners among all the counties in Kenya. So yeah, it is a responsibility, but we are ready for the challenge. All right, Lena, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. And uh, what a great way to spend an interview with Lena here in the Maasai Mara National Reserve. Beautiful wildlife all around us. Thank you so much for the opportunity. You are watching NTV Wild Talk. It is now time for a break, but not before we give you the opportunity to take a wild guess. On Wild Guess, we ask, what kind of plan does Tourism Minister for Narok, Lena Munge, intend to focus on to address challenges in the Maasai Mara? What kind of plan does Tourism Minister for Narok, Lena Munge, intend to focus on to address challenges in the Maasai Mara? Use the hashtag NTV Wild on Twitter or like our NTV Wild Facebook page and post your answer there. 
The first person to answer correctly wins dinner or lunch for two people at the Café Villa Rosa, an all-day international buffet restaurant at the Kempinski Hotel. This prize is courtesy of the Kempinski Villa Rosa. You'll also win a gift hamper from Wildlife Direct. Welcome back to NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyalfi. Before we continue, here is a reminder of our Wild Guess question. On Wild Guess, we ask, what kind of plan does Tourism Minister for Narok, Lena Munge, intend to focus on to address challenges in the Maasai Mara? What kind of plan does Tourism Minister for Narok, Lena Munge, intend to focus on to address challenges in the Maasai Mara? Use the hashtag NTV Wild on Twitter or like our NTV Wild Facebook page and post your answer there. The first person to answer correctly wins dinner or lunch for two people at the Café Villa Rosa, an all-day international buffet restaurant at the Kempinski Hotel. This prize is courtesy of the Kempinski Villa Rosa. You'll also win a gift hamper from Wildlife Direct. Now, this man isn't such a new face. He left the tourism industry, but now he's back. I spoke to Najib Balala, the Cabinet Secretary for Tourism, about the importance of wildlife to the industry. We are at the Sarat Centre Holidays Fair, in particular the Olare Mara Kempinski stand here at the fair. Najib Balala, great to have you with us. You're back in business in terms of the tourism docket. How does it feel to be back? Well, uh, I, I wake up in the morning happier every day because I feel I'm energized with new ideas. The good thing also because I have been there before, so all those mistakes that maybe I have done, I don't want to repeat them again. Uh, I'm glad uh, it's going to be challenging because the dynamics have changed from uh, five years ago. But uh, I think uh, I have the support of the industry. We are working very closely. We have established a working relationship we're going to have a round table meeting on the 22nd with the industry. They tell me what they expect from us. I'm going to tell them what they expect. I expect from them. So it's a partnership. Uh, so it's exciting. And also, uh, I'm honored by the president's appointment that uh, he brought me back uh, where maybe I know better. As you mentioned, things have certainly changed over the last five years. The industry was hit hard and you really are back in business at a very critical time. How would you describe the tourism industry right now in 2016? Where are we? Well, this opportunity to transform it uh, and build a foundation that is going to be sustainable. I think uh, we are tired. Every two, three years, we shut down the sector, either through politics or the incidents or calamities. I think uh, we need now to reflect properly and say that what do we want to do in the next 10 years. In fact, uh, I'm going to appoint a consultant to do for me a strategy for the next 10 years so that we are stable industry rather of a volatile industry. So yes, it's changed, but this is a time to change. Are we at a good place? Uh, yes, uh, once because we have the goodwill of the government. Uh, there's also understanding between the government in terms of the ministry and the private sector and everybody learns their lessons that we need to work as a team rather of they and us. You know, we know that loads of foreigners come to Kenya primarily for its wildlife first and then perhaps its beaches. How important is wildlife to tourism? Well, we cannot do without wildlife. Tourism cannot succeed in Kenya without wildlife. We have an age over tourism to the rest of the world because we have beaches, everybody has beaches. But do we have wildlife and beach? No, it's only Kenya. It's integrated well and because we are in the same country. So, so we have, wildlife is a tourism-based product. Uh, we cannot do without wildlife. And, and, and that's, the, that's the age we have. Despite we can, we can diversify to new products, uh, and I don't want to discuss them about, about them now. But this is an opportunity where we make sure that the, 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 the synergies between wildlife and beach works well. Yeah, so it's not one against the other. 
and that's the advantage uh, we have against the rest of the world. Well, since wildlife is so crucial to tourism, what then, if anything, is the Ministry of Tourism doing to protect our wildlife? Because we know that many of our species, especially the elephant, is under threat. Well, the beauty about it is the client-driven uh, conscious. The new clients want to be conscious about conservation, they want to be conscious about democracy and human rights, they want to be conscious about environmental and clean energy. So we have a drive from the client themselves. We are facilitating as government. And yes, we are doing clean energy. Kenya is well known in the continent. Yes, yes, we have invested in democracy, and that's why we are having democracy and elections every five years. We want it to be peaceful. Yes, yes, we have we have banned hunting and 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 and, and, and poaching because we we believe that wildlife is a source of developing economic development for, 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 for our country. So yes, these are the programs. We have invested a lot in conservations, yeah? but now with the porous borders that we have, and then we are, we, the challenge is poaching, but we have invested a lot through KWS and other agencies against poaching. You know, you talk about the clients, and essentially a lot of people look at the clients for tourism as foreigners, but we also know that domestic tourism is so important. We need to educate um, our people as well about the importance of our wildlife and traveling the country. What is the ministry doing to promote domestic tourism? Today we are here in Salit Center for the, for the travel expo, uh, the holiday expo. This is targeted for the domestic market. We have Tembea, Kenya. We have a whole program. We have invested almost 100 million Kenyan shillings this financial year to domestic marketing. We believe, and, and, and I want to thank Kenyans, that during the difficult time of tourism, it's the Kenyans who have supported and become resilient to the sector. So yes, Kenyans have been supported. Now if we want the hoteliers and the industry to be receptive to the Kenyan market, we need to reduce the prices, we need to make it affordable for Kenya. It's ridiculous to have a 40% occupancy while you can create an 80% occupancy with Kenyans. And I warn people in the industry, anybody going to discriminate Kenyans because of their color or because of their nationality, action is going to be taken against those facilities. What would you say are some of the immediate priorities for the Ministry of Tourism? Well, we have selected three. One is product development and refreshing of the product. That's why we are coming with a refurbishment fund so that we can be able to avail credit lines that are affordable and then renew our product and modernize the product. Because we are in a competition not only to Tanzania, we are in competition with the Caribbean. Yeah, yeah. So we have an advantage to the Caribbean by having wildlife to us. So we are in competition to the international tourism sector. Second is training and capacity building. We cannot have a good sector if we don't provide the people who serve with the right caliber of service. And the third is marketing. So marketing, we are investing, we are, trying, we are, we are reforming Kenya Tourism Board. My peers have just come back from a board meeting there to actually support them in their programs and investing heavily in marketing. We have dedicated annually, that's our target. Every year we target two billion shillings budget for marketing and Kenya Tourism Board will be the agency that execute the program of government for marketing. All right, now, um, Najib Balala, some of the headlines uh, several weeks ago in the newspaper said, Tourism CS jumps out of plane. <laughs> you know, it really, really grabbed the attention of a lot of people. You've obviously been in this uh, docket before, but since you've come back, what is one of the wildest things that you have done? Perhaps it's that. I haven't imagined that I was going to jump out of the plane. And luckily, I didn't tell my wife before. <laughs> she's a bit angry, but uh, she's, I don't she, blame forgave, her. <laughs> she, she forgave me about it. But yes, it's doing things differently. And it has to start from the top. It is a political will that we change our style of doing business. We'll get new results. If we do them the same way, we'll get the same results. And it had to start from me. So I had to jump from the plane <laughs> to give us, an example. Tell us more about that. What was it for and how did it ultimately make a difference? Well, the whole objective was actually to do conservation of the turtle. And in then Watamu. The, in Watamu. And I'm glad Watamu has got recognition. And we want to do in Diani something different, not competing with what with, with there. We want to do something in Laikipia. We want to do something in Savo West. So areas where people did not imagine 
Yes, we want to do everything in Masai Mara, but Masai Mara is not the only thing we have in Kenya. We have Meru National Park, we want to go there. We have Kakamega Forest that we want to go there. We have Lake Victoria, why can't we have a cruise on Lake Victoria? It's not rocket science. So these are the things we want to do. Next, uh, this month, I'm going to open a national reserve that is established by the county government of Geo Marakwet. Yeah? So these are the programs we want to support and I will be available to do different things everywhere. But yes, I think uh, it's an exciting time to do skydiving and I want to encourage people, Kenya is beyond just beach and safari. We can do sports, we can do culture, we can do adventure, rock climbing we can do, walking safari we can do. So we can do so many things. We want to go to the Camel Derby, Derby in, in, in Marsabet. Yeah, in Marala, and do that and, and, and profile it as an international event. Yeah. If it takes the minister to be there, I will be there. All right, all eyes on you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your Thank time you. and uh, who knows where we'll next see you. Maybe, perhaps not walking with lions, but uh, something a little bit safer than that. No, we take you in sky dive. Oh yeah, sure, I'm, I'm game. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much you for much. your Thank time. You. With me, the Tourism Cabinet Secretary Najib Balala. We're coming to you from the Sarat Center Holidays Fair and we are seated in a beautiful environment. This is the Olare Mara Kempinski setup. Part of the reason as to why we need to care for our wildlife is for the future generations. Here now is a boy who is part of the next generation and who's doing wonders for wildlife awareness. I spoke to him at the home of photographer Andreas Bifani. Luca, you're just done with school. Thank you so much for making time this afternoon to be with us on NTV Wild Talk. Who is Luca? Um, Luca is a 12 year old boy who goes to Nairobi International School. Um, he uh, created a small organization at the age of eight um, that's called YARH, Young Animal Rescue Heroes, which basically creates awareness for endangered wildlife and environmental conservation through various projects like recycling projects, um, networking workshops, um, and other projects. Um, I also sing and an act. Luca, you are such a young guy, only 12 years old, and uh, before you turned 12, you started up your own company, which is brilliant. And of course, like you just said, it works to protect uh, our wildlife here in Kenya. Why did you do that? Why is it important to you as a young boy? I've always loved animals, ever since I was a little boy, um, until I found out that uh, the animals were becoming endangered and that people were killing them, the forests were being cut down, and all that was happening. So I, um, I found a library book when I was in my old school, and I found that there are more than 18,000 endangered animals in the world just because of us being greedy. So that literally um, sparked the flame for the idea for YRH. So tell us more about some of the projects that YRH does. Um, we started the, the first project, which is a recycling project uh, for paper, which we uh, work with uh, Chendaria Industries. And also we recycle Tetra Packs, milk and juice cartons to uh, make dustbins, desks and um, all sorts of useful things. We also do workshops. Uh, we invite schools to talk about the importance of wildlife and the environment. Luca, I'm going to refer to one of your tweets because on World Wildlife Day, that was the 3rd of March, you tweeted that all I hope for is this madness of wildlife crimes stops today. Hashtag World Wildlife Day. Why is that important to you? I've always loved animals. So, especially on World Wildlife Day, I found it, I, um, I found it as an opportunity just to just say what I thought was right because animals are being killed for just us being greedy and that for me is not right. Do you get, what kind of support do you get for the work that you do? Um, I get support from my parents. Um, my mom and dad are always behind me helping me with uh, all my work so I really thank them. And also, of course, Chindaria Industries, Ecotech, the, the companies that help us with the recycling projects. I also thank them too. 
Luca, you talked about um, the support you get from your parents. How important is it that parents encourage the younger generation to do something and take note of what's happening? It should be like that or else that the, the future generation will become discouraged and they won't have the opportunities um, to uh, do what they want to do in life. Um, they won't get the opportunities to express their feelings for the environment. They won't get the opportunity to share their passion for animals. And how can you encourage uh, young people who want to do something for wildlife and the environment to join in? What can they do? Well, first it has to start with the parents to um, encourage them uh, so that they can do what they want to do. Um, but also, uh, we invite schools, as I said, for workshops so we can also educate them on why it is that we have to save our endangered wildlife, why it is we have to save these forests. Um, and also, we, um, we also like taking trips with schools also to um, different places to uh, help them network with the wildlife because sometimes the schools, they, they don't have a connection with the animals, which is, um, which is what is lacking in this new generation of ours. And so if someone wants to get in touch with you, how can they? Are you on Facebook? I know you are on Twitter, but tell us about um, how people can contact you or in, and your company. Um, of course, Twitter and also uh, Facebook at uh, Luca Berardi. That's L-U-C-A-B-E-R-A-R-D-I. Um, those are the um, places where you can find us. Luca, you talked about future generations. Now, you are the future generation. You're only a 12-year-old boy. What is your message to, say, the president of Kenya or to the public out there and also to poachers about wildlife? That wildlife, if we don't protect it as we should, then it's all going to perish. It's not going to stay there if we don't put our mind to it and to the poachers to stop doing what they're doing because it's not helping anyone, nor the people who are trying to help these animals, nor the animals themselves who are being killed. So I'd have to say that if we don't work, if we don't try to help the animals and the environment, then we won't let it cherish for the future generations, but we'll just leave it to perish. Luca, what do you want to keep doing when you grow up? Do you want to keep being involved in conservation? What is your ultimate goal with this project? Um, of course, throughout my life, I'd like to uh, continue with uh, my conservation work um, to uh, spread the mes message, not only in Kenya, but to the whole world about what is happening to the environment and also what's happening to the animals. I'd actually want to be uh, an actor and film director. Luca, how do you manage your time? Because like we've said, you're only 12 years old, you go to school, but you're also interested in the arts, um, music and acting as well, and in cons conservation. So how do you manage your time? Tell us about that. Well, as I always say, I always do schoolwork first. I always come home, I do my homework. Then I, if I have to uh, practice my piano, I'll do that. Um, my voice, lessons, of course. Um, then also do a little bit of conservation work, learn about animals and... So it's a lot of work. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. It is. All right, and Luca, have you ever thought about connecting the two, music and acting with wildlife? I always thought there could be a connection, but we haven't yet um, put it into uh, practice. But we're thinking about doing our next workshop um, involving the two and having fun along with the arts, but also at the base with conservation and wildlife. And based on your experience, I'm sure you've traveled out there, you've done a lot of workshops. What perhaps is your wildest moment or your most interesting experience out in the wild with nature and the environment? Well, there was this time that I actually um, first saw a lion. That must have been the wildest moment I had, oh, although they were sleeping. <laughs> it, it was good enough for me. How the old first, were you? I was, where? I was um, around, I, w I think I was around eight or nine, and we were at the Shaba, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yeah. So that was your most wild experience? Yeah, it was beautiful. I can imagine, I can imagine. You, of course, enjoy singing and ultimately you want to be a singer and an actor. Um, sing a song for us, go on. Um, there's an event that, uh, that went on the, after World Wildlife Day. Uh, I sang a song called uh, Sam Smith, Writings on the Wall. So this is how it goes. Uh, I have been here before, but always hit the floor. I've spent a lifetime running, and I always get away. But with you, I'm feeling something that makes me want to stay. I am prepared. For this, I never shoot to miss, but I feel like a storm is coming. If I'm gonna make it through the day, then there's no more use in running. This is something I gotta face. If I risk it all. Could you break my fall? How do I live? How do I breathe? When you're not here, I'm suffocating. I want to feel love right through my blood. Tell me, is this where I give it all up? Feel I have to risk it all. Cause the writing's on the wall. That was beautiful. Luca, thank you so much and well done. We wish you all the very best. Thank you for your time on NTV Wild Talk. Thank you. So from a cabinet secretary to a 12-year-old boy, these are just some of the faces that are doing something for wildlife. But what is it that you're doing? It certainly is something to think about. In the meantime, though, here is what's coming up on NTV Wild on Saturday night. In Africa, there lives an extraordinary tree. She is the queen of the riverbank, a monarch whose story stretches back millions of years. That's all on this week's NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you again Tuesday at 10 p.m.